Welcome, everyone. <clears throat> We're going to go ahead and get started because we don't have a lot of time. So if you need translation things, please put them in now. My name is Josh Burkus. Um, I work for Red Hat. Um, these days, what I work on all the time is Kubernetes. Um, I'm in SIG release, SIG contribute experience, um, spend a bunch of time working around with storage stuff. But how I got into Kubernetes in the first place was I was looking for a way to host and automate databases for fully automated HA application stacks. And one of the things I, what's come up there is one of the things I got originally was can you run databases in Kubernetes cloud native environment? Um, and there are people who said no. Um, it's a fairly famous tweet uh, from a conversation I had with Kelsey Hightower um, where he's like, no, don't run databases um, on Kubernetes um, for uh, a variety of reasons. And so we discussed some of this at a previous conference um, and talked about the reasons why he would say something like that. And there are a number of reasons. Um, number one is running a database on Kubernetes um, with the exception of implementing HA, aside from that, running a, Kubernetes and database, a database on Kubernetes is no easier than running a database on bare metal. And therefore, you need the same skills. Just putting it on Kubernetes does not make DBA headaches go away. Second thing is setting up storage for Kubernetes um, can be complicated and hard to figure out. Um, and the third reason potentially is performance. Um, this is one of the things people are worried about, right? If I put my database in Kubernetes, what is performance going to be like? Now, um, I'm involved with another project that's dealing with the storage setup complexity issue. It's the Rook project um, I, in order to be able to set up cloud native storage for Kubernetes and OpenShift and make that easy. Um, I don't have answers for you in the database management thing. I was literally this morning troubleshooting a thing for a project I'm involved in where um, one of the developers noticed an error from the database and they decided to try and fix it, which meant that they needed to then call me up and fix what the developer did. Because you still need to actually understand how the database works, even if it's operating in a cloud native environment. So what this talk is about actually is the third component, which is performance, which is if I throw my databases on Kubernetes, on cloud native storage, how do they perform? Is it good enough for my applications? And that's what I've been spending a few months um, on a particular cluster working on. Now, the reason why performance is critical is a couple of things. One is, um, if you talk to any group of database geeks, any group of system infrastructure admin geeks, they care about performance, right? I mean, one of the first questions they ask, and therefore you have to have an answer for them. Um, the second thing is, for any platform, there's this trade-off between ease of use, ease of management, and speed. Um, the, um, I, you know, just an example. For example, low-level programming languages, things like C, let alone assembler, execute faster than higher-level languages that are often easier to use and easier to learn. And the same is true in infrastructure platforms. Um, and then a third is, if your application was designed to expect a certain level of performance from the database, then if you can't get that level of performance on a cloud native platform, that is going to be a blocker to migrating to Kubernetes and cloud native technology in general. So you don't want it to be a blocker. The other reason is, I've been doing database performance stuff since my hair was still blonde. <laughs> so I'm not gonna stop. Um, I actually find it kind of fun because I'm weird that way. So, and the main way that you actually deal with database performance is through benchmarking. Now, we've got a bunch of people here from PINCAP. They know what database benchmarking is, et cetera. But for everybody else, to talk a little bit about what benchmarking is and benchmarking isn't. So, when we're talking about benchmarking stuff, we're actually talking about comparing, right? We want to compare two things that are equal in all but one respect, so we can find out what effect that difference has. You know, 
So benchmarking uh, between two different types of storage to, from one release to another, um, from one configuration change to another, or from the requirements that we already have on spec of must return X number of responses per second, right? This is what we're looking on comparing. And so anytime you are looking at benchmarking, you should be saying, what two things or three things or 10 things am I going to be comparing? Now, for this talk, what I am actually comparing is types of storage. Because part of the way I get started in this, I work at Red Hat. Um, I work, collaborate with the Ceph and Rook teams that we have at Red Hat. And one of the things we wanted to look at is if you have pure cloud native storage, like a Rook Ceph stack, is performance on that acceptable for a database workload? Nobody had an answer, um, that I, nobody a good answer that I saw uh, before I started doing it. And so um, over time I've been comparing four different, your four different basic types of storage, right? We have bare metal, um, we have Kubernetes but using node local storage, that's either uh, local DIR or local PV, um, network storage, um, so node local storage is like host path, network storage, which is like um, EBS cloud provider storage or whatever, and then cloud native distributed storage, so something like a Rook Ceph combo or other advanced file systems. Now, I already did a run for this, and you can actually find my talk from KubeCon Seattle, where I did comparisons on AWS, and I actually checked on performance for cloud native storage, for um, cloud provider storage, for network storage. So I'm not going to actually be providing a comparison for network storage today because this set of tests is all about the bare metal. Now, beyond that, we need to talk about types of IO performance um, that you get in a database workload. So database workloads basically do four things, and they often do them concurrently with each other, right? You have random reads, so reading one f small fact at a time, Random writes, writing one small fact at a time. Sequential reads, when you read big blocks of data, and sequential writes, when you write big blocks of data. Databases will do all of these things concurrently or consecutively, and so we care about the performance of all of them. Now, generally when we're doing a synthetic benchmark, we can actually combine the random reads and random writes, um, which we'll be doing in these benchmarks that I show you, because most workloads that do random reads do random writes, et cetera, and you can do them together without messing with the numbers. And then we actually care about two different classes of metrics for those, right? We care about latency, which is if we make a request, how long does it take that request to return? Um, affects application performance, right? And we also care about throughput, which is how many requests per second or how many megabytes of data per second can I, say, read from or write to the database um, for throughput. So we care about both of these. And so what we have here is three different storage platforms, three um, different types of I.O. and two different classes of metrics that we care about. That's a lot of different tests across the different environments. Fortunately, the database industry for a long time has been obsessed with benchmarking things. And so there are tons of tools and benchmarking tools and measurement tools already designed to generate these kinds of traffic and record this kinds of information that you can just use and tap into. And I'll be naming a few of those here. Um, um, particularly what I'm gonna be talking about because this was easy for me to do since this is not my full-time job, most of my job is managing Kubernetes community stuff, um, is I ran a series of what are known as micro benchmarks. So you have your benchmark suites, things like transaction processing council and spec and stuff, that have an enormous amount, a battery of different things that they do, and they're audited and that sort of thing. And that's, that's a benchmark, benchmark with a capital B. Um, and then you have micro benchmarks, which are smaller, easy to run workloads. And these are generally, if you're running it personally for yourself, and you're not doing it for publication, you just wanna know how your hardware performs, micro benchmarks is what you're looking at. Um, and actually ran three different micro benchmarks, SysBench, Postgres's PGBench, and the CockroachDB workloads. Um, unfortunately, uh, I am going to show you the CockroachDB workloads and the results that I got, but these are no longer open source. So this is the last time that you will see these from me um, because they changed the license for them and they're not open source anymore, unfortunately. So talk about SysBench. SysBench is a nice toolkit. Like, first thing you should try, honestly, is SysBench. 
because it's a sort of omnibus microbenchmark created by the MySQL folks years ago. It can do tests of a whole bunch of different system performance, CPU, memories, um, database tests, I.O. tests, that sort of thing. In this example, I'm just using it to test directly some of the I.O. operations. Um, Postgres PG Bench is a super simple database benchmark. It ships with Postgres. Um, it does a database micro benchmark, and it measures basically two things. One is random transactional reads and writes. Um, and then the second thing is load and index times, um, which would simulate an, uh, a data load analytics workload. And then the CogwitchDB people created this really nice suite of light benchmarks um, that they use to, and then publish them as open source originally, um, including Bank, which is a lot like PG Bench um, in its operation, and TPCC, which is a much more complex, write heavy workload with a lot of lock, locking inside of it and lock conflicts, um, which is a common problem in databases. Um, and the two of these within that suite is I found Bank was really good for measuring throughput, and TPCC was really good for measuring latency for complex operations um, that need to do transactions. So now let me give you some tips because part of my goal in this talk is not necessarily to show you the numbers that I have because the numbers that I have are not your numbers. Your hardware is not my hardware, your application is not my application, and your stack is not my stack. What I want you to get out of this is you can do this yourself and you should do this yourself, particularly before you deploy a new platform in production. And it's not that hard. So let me give you a few tips on that. One is if you're running micro benchmarking, you need to do a bunch of runs. Don't run it once, record that number, and say that's how it is. Because there's a certain amount of randomness in all of these benchmarks. And if you just depend on a single run, the randomness may be what you get um, instead of a real thing. You also need to do long runs. A lot of people make the mistake of, oh, I did a 30 second run and I got this. Well, you have memory cache effects and CPU cache effects and a lot of things where you will get artificially inflated performance on really short runs. And you really need to see how the system is gonna behave under a more sustained load. Um, ideally, you want to do multiple database and file sizes. Particularly, you wanna measure both things that fit in memory and things that don't. Um, you wanna do multiple, you want a concurrent workload because your real production workload is going to be concurrent. So multiple users accessing the database or the file storage at the same time. Um, and you wanna use bare metal. Now, a lot of people are like this, well, why would I wanna use bare metal? Well, here's the problem. I've done also a lot of benchmarking on cloud providers. And the problem with benchmarking on cloud providers is that a lot of your performance effects have more to do with who else is on the cloud with you than they do with any changes in platform. So like, if you look at the stuff that I presented in Seattle, if you look at benchmarking runs in AWS, I consider a minimum number of runs for a single AWS workload at a specific size to be like 25. And for each of those, I actually recreate the instances because you never know what's gonna be the effect of a bad instance or a noisy neighbor. Um, also, frankly, a large cloud um, instance is a pretty small bare metal instance. And as a result, you're not really going to be testing things for really large workloads. So, um, if you have a choice of platforms, bare metal is going to actually give you more useful results. So, that said, let's look at some numbers, because um, it's one of the things that we care about here, right? So, I also want to add some caution here, which is, please do not compare the numbers between different benchmarks and different databases. These numbers are not meant to be comparable, right? So, the TPCC, benchmark for CockroachDB does not perform the same activity as the PG Bench one for Postgres, and those numbers are not comparable. Um, the databases were minimally tuned on purpose. Um, basically, I did the pro forma performance tuning that you could do in 10 minutes for any of the databases, because that's kind of what most people are running on, on top of which I didn't want to make this an exercise in performance tuning the database. My goal was to test the cloud-native platforms. Um, and then again, like I said, 
my software, my hardware is going to be different from yours. You need to test yours and not just read my numbers. So here was our bare metal platform that I was doing this on. I'm continuing to run tests on this because I have this cluster. It's a six blade cluster. Um, each of the blades is 20 cores, 128 gigabytes of RAM, um, uh, two SSDs with 200 gigabytes of storage each, and a shared network. Um, this is in the open source lab at Red Hat. Um, it's stuff that we have. We had it for testing something else um, in the past, and I repurposed it for this. Now, there is one caveat here that limited the kind of tests I can run. Now, for one of the things you want to test is things that fit in memory and things that don't fit in memory. The problem is that when you have a drive that's 200 gigabytes and you have 128 gigabytes of RAM, it's very hard to test the out of memory use case because you'll run out of disk space. So you won't be seeing that in my numbers. My numbers are all going to be fits in memory use cases. Um, because I don't have the storage to do out of memory use cases. I'm waiting on some new SSDs so I can actually test that. So, um, and that does mean because of that, the primary I.O. we're actually measuring is file sync time, the time to actually write and commit stuff to disk rather than raw throughput from the storage. That's going to dominate our numbers. The other thing is I have a shared network, and that had an effect on one of the tests later on that I will show you um, uh, that, uh, that eclipsed the effect that I wanted to get in terms of actually comparing things. So um, the first set of tests that I ran is you want to start out with a caveat. You want to start out with a benchmark of this is, this is what I would get on a plain platform before I do cloud native anything, right? And so we get a host file system where I've got a host install, no Kubernetes to get reference numbers, just using XFS and LVM, um, and hosting databases and file storage on that. So first we're going to start out with Sysbench that is just going to check the sort of direct I.O. numbers. It does a bunch of I.O. operations in C um, and records those back. And so the numbers that we got here from the SSDs here, right, is that random reads per second, 10,000, whatever, high number because we're getting this out of memory because, again, I can't actually use a file size that's bigger than memory. Um, so that should be really fast, and it is. But also, random writes are also really fast, right? 7,000 random writes per second, nice fast SSDs, being able to use two of them there. Um, I can read 22 gigabytes per second of data, so here's our throughput numbers, um, and I can write 88 megabytes per second of data. So here you see this is going to be a typical pattern of SSDs where SSDs are much faster than old spinning drives for random writes, but they're not necessarily all that faster on throughput <coughs> um, because that's writing big blocks of data. Now, a little bit more complicated chart here. This is the set of database benchmark. So we've got PG Bench, where we want to get some throughput in terms of database load time, simulating <coughs> loading large no amounts of data into the database. Transactions per second um, for another measure of throughput and then average latency um, to measure latency. And then for bank, similarly on CockroachDB, transactions per second, 95% latency. Um, and TBCC, when you're actually doing that benchmark competitively, the standard is new orders per, per essentially new order transactions per minute, I'm doing per second. Um, and so that's what I actually have there. Um, whether or not I'm meeting an arbitrary target of how many new orders I can process. Um, and 90% latency. So on the bare thing, um, for PG Bench, um, 404 seconds for the bulk load. Um, so again, lower is better here. 404 seconds for the bulk load, 11,000 transactions per second. So I'm actually doing slightly better than the file system. So there we see Postgres's batch writing kicking in. Um, and then an average latency of 2.8 milliseconds. Now, one of the things I actually discovered through this is um, it's a lot easier to install and configure CockroachDB on Kubernetes than it is to do it on bare metal. Um, as a matter of fact, I was getting performance figures that were so bad that I was sure that I had misconfigured something somehow in the bare metal install. And all of the CockroachDB instructions and advice on how to configure CockroachDB for performance is oriented at a Kubernetes environment. Um, and so I'm not going to show you those numbers because I don't think that they're realistic. Um, and then after that, CockroachDB changed the license, so I'm not going to rerun any of that. 
Um, so then the next thing here is to use local volumes. And this actually, if you are concerned, if you're hosting a database in Kubernetes and you're concerned about Kubernetes database performance, then this is actually what you're probably going to be doing provided that your database can manage replication and failover itself um, without being dependent on Kubernetes persistent volumes to do it for it, is that you do local storage either using host path uh, or using the new local PVs um, in order to do storage. And the thing is, this is local storage in a container, and so performance should be almost identical to bare metal performance, right? Because all we have is some C groups overhead um, and whatever Kubernetes networking overhead is. And otherwise, we really are running on bare metal. So let's look at that here. So Sysbench here, again, minuscule difference um, with the Sysbench tests. I mean, almost immeasurably small um, in terms of a difference with just running on straight bare metal. Um, the database tests are a little bit more different, right? Um, so, one of the things, so bulk load is, is a little bit slower, 10% slower. The um, uh, transactional throughput, 15% lower, and latency is higher. And those two go together, right? Higher latency, lower throughput on a random write workload makes a lot of sense. And here we have our first numbers from CockroachDB, which we're going to be comparing later on with cloud native storage, um, where we've got um, these operations and that sort of thing. But let's talk about what's going on here because that was a much higher penalty than I was expecting for just having a basically container wrapper around it. Um, you remember I mentioned that we were on a shared network for the set of blades? Well, that's actually what's going on here because, so for the bare metal test, I had to run the PG Bench client on bare metal, which means that to make things a good comparison, I'm still running the PG Bench client on bare metal and using node port to route it to Postgres running on Kubernetes. The problem with that is that means that we've actually added a couple of extra network hops for every request. And in a workload like PG Bench that has a lot of requests whose entire you know, throughput time is less than a millisecond, those extra network hops really count. Um, and as a result, and particularly on a shared network where we don't have a dedicated network for Kubernetes networking, um, you can really see that in the increased latency and the dropped throughput. So, next storage configuration, right? This is, this is what I really cared about comparing, right? Because this is what I'm looking at evaluating here, right? So we've got rook storage and a five node rook plus Ceph cluster, um, only two replicas per, um, per data block. Um, because it was such a small cluster, I didn't want to do the standard 3x replication because we're only talking about five rook nodes. Um, the, um, some default tweaks off of the rook documentation for performance. Um, and also, by the way, here's an important thing. I'm going to be showing you CockroachDB things. So there's two different ways you can do CockroachDB with rook. One is you, the standard thing to do is you run, have rook manage CockroachDB for you, which is honestly the easiest way to install CockroachDB if you still want to install it at this point. Um, but my goal was to test Ceph performance, so I was actually installing CockroachDB on top of Ceph rather than installing CockroachDB with Rook. This is probably not something you would actually do because CockroachDB and Ceph provide similar levels of redundancy, and so I have double redundancy here, um, which is probably not necessary for most workloads. But it does help me measure performance. So let's look at Sysbench here. So just off of raw stuff, I was really pleasantly surprised by what we were looking for raw file I.O., right? I mean, that is minority um, uh, loss of performance. Now, mind you, keep in mind, this is files that fit in memory. Um, but um, even with the writes, Rook is just not imposing much of a penalty on my write speed um, for those. I mean, considering that, I basically have an automated backup in this, right? I'm, uh, those files all exist in two places. Um, that's actually really nice. Um, the biggest thing that we're actually seeing there is, um, and then the other weird thing is, for my sequential reads, my large block reads, it's actually faster. Um, so I talked to some of the Ceph people about this, like why it would be faster on sequential reads than bare metal, and it turns out that 
Ceph, if you're reading a bunch of <coughs> contiguous blocks, it will try to pull them from multiple replicas so you can read them faster. And it turns out that that has a real life benefit in the sequential read case. Now let's actually talk a little bit about the database benchmarks here, right? So bulk load got slower, expected that, but only about a third slower. And the biggest thing is my latency doubled, which is not a big surprise, again, for redundant cloud-native storage. What is pleasant is that it only about doubled. Um, how many people here have worked with forms of redundant clustered file systems before? Because I've been doing this for a while. I've been doing this for a number of years. And doubled is actually a very good number. Um, for some of the older ones, like Moose, OrangeFS, and stuff, we would be looking at more like quadrupling um, or quintupling the latency. And so double latency is actually pretty good, because we are, after all, writing everything twice. Um, so same thing with the CockroachDB benchmarks is we're getting about double the latency and half the throughput, which are directly related to each other. Now, TPCC is a target-based benchmark. <clears throat> so that 1290 is how many transactions did we complete that were within the target window, not what's the maximum number of transactions we can complete. And we could still make the threshold because that double latency was still below our threshold. And Rook, you know, Ceph didn't add any additional overhead. Um, now, some things I actually want to do to tinker with this is obviously I want to actually do it on something without a shared network so I can eliminate the shared network effects from my figures. Um, I want to actually get bigger SSDs um, so that I can do bigger workload. Um, not going to be doing CockroachDB anymore. I'll be looking at another cloud native database um, to actually do performance tests on um, and to maybe do some additional test tuning. But let me give you some conclusions, some walkways from this is, first of all, you can benchmark your own hardware and your own cloud native stack with simple database benchmarks to test the performance of that stack. Um, and whether or not you need to change it. Local volume performance should be roughly equivalent to bare metal. Um, and Rook Ceph has good throughput, but about double the latency um, compared to running on bare metal. Which, again, if the redundancy, if the cloud native storage is valuable to you, double the latency is good. If it's not valuable to you, you should be aware that that exists. Um, more important things, beware secondary issues that look like performance differences, like my shared network problems. Um, and an important thing, and go back to look at my, my presentation from KubeCon Seattle, and you will see that on public cloud, cloud latency effects mask a lot of performance differences. Um, that you can't actually see a lot of these performance differences because the effect of the cloud itself is so large. So, uh, questions, contact? Um, if you have questions about Rook, a couple of the Rook developers are here at the conference, um, and you can find them. There's going to be actually two Rook talks later today, one in the next time slot, one at 6 p.m., um, so you can find out about that. Um, my contact information, and we have about uh, four or five minutes for questions, I think. So, questions. Go for it. Um, can we pass this back? Hello. Oh, thank you. Thank you for your talk. Uh, I have some questions. The first is that uh, what kind of the SSD did you use uh, in the testing? Um, I don't remember the model right off. Okay. I'll have to get back to you on that. So we, uh, we built these systems a while ago, and I just don't remember what the model was. Is this SATA or NVMe? Um, no, it's PCI bus. PCI, OK. Yeah. So uh, the second is. Uh, for the uh, benchmark result of the sysbench yeah. uh, for the bare metal environment. Uh, I see the sequential write is quite a, a small number that just uh, some no more than 100 megabytes yeah. per second. So uh, why is it so slow? Um, the um, Probably those S the SSDs, right? Is that ultimately I'm writing to a single SSD um, and, you know, both the bus and the RAM cache on the SSD, you know, with a large write, because it's writing several gigabytes of data, the RAM cache on the SSD is going to fill up pretty quickly. 
Um, and then at that point, you're going to actually be at its performance, which apparently isn't that great. So the, um, I didn't actually care that much about it except to get it for reference. Uh, but that's not actually that unusual for large writes. Is all of SSD's benefits are in random writes and small writes, et cetera. Um, for large writes, you're operating in the performance of um, whatever the slowest component in the whole bus is, um, which apparently was not that fast in this case. These are blades, after all, and not full servers. OK. Uh, another question is, uh, in your staff environment, so uh, did you use the same uh, configuration of SAF, uh, for example, two SSE, and so what um, is the configuration for SAF? Uh, yes, but Ceph likes raw devices, so it used each SSD separately. So each SSD is a separate device, and Ceph handles bundling them together. So maybe for one SSD, you have multiple OSD. Um, no, I think, well, wait. I think each one is one OSD, isn't okay. it? Yeah, each one is one. Each one is one OSD. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, more questions? Surely our database crew here has some questions. No? Have you guys tested anything on Ceph, Rook? Minio, any of the cloud native storage things? Okay. Well, thank you.